say welcome to to Laszlo and uh, have fun. Yes, thank you. Wow, it works awesome. So, yes, my final talk at the World Summit is about, you know, again, cute and embedded, but this time we have a real device here with us, like a Prescale Saber SD board. And uh, yes, now we'll see it and its camera in action. And, you know, to make it more exciting, we'll use cute multimedia because, you know, Video playback or getting, you know, the input stream from the camera is, of course, exciting to many people. And also, we'll use an external framework, in this case, OpenCV, uh, to show really that, you know, integrating such frameworks with, with, with Qt and Qt Multimedia is pretty easy, even when you are targeting embedded Linux. So, oh yeah. Yes, so for those who don't yet know, I'm Lars Loagoch, I'm working for the Qt company in Oslo, Norway, and uh, well, I'm mainly working in the area of graphics, and that mainly means OpenGL and embedded. And yeah, I also do all sorts of platform integration work dealing with windowing systems. Yeah, things like that. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, you probably know that Qt, of course, is great for creating user interfaces, especially when it comes to Qt Quick and, you know, controls like Qt Quick controls. And, of course, Qt Multimedia ties into here quite naturally because, you know, elements like camera, media player, or video output, these make it, as we'll see, these make it pretty, you know, easy to really get to add either video playback, possibly hardware accelerated video playback, or camera capabilities to any application in a cross-platform manner. But the real interesting question is that what do you do if you are interested in more than just simply showing the, you know, like, like the video images be because you might want to do some processing. Either you want to modify, the frames, or maybe you just want to, you know, calculate something, say, recognize certain objects, track some motion, and so on and so on. And this is when, you know, you will typically start using, you know, an external computer vision framework, say, OpenCV, and then you start thinking about how do you integrate this with Qt. So the, you know, first step is usually pretty simple because, you know, if you just have a single still image, which is typically a Q image, then, you know, there's usually a pretty straightforward way to convert that to the, you know, image uh, class or whatever format the, the other framework uses. So in our case, you know, OpenCV has this mat type, which is, you know, for many image formats, formats the conversion is straightforward straightforward. Sometimes it's not because, you know, for example, QImage cannot really handle YUV uh, uh, data, so it's a bit more limited than the OpenCV counterpart. But uh, still, that's usually not, not that much of an issue. But what if you are using Qt Quick and you're interested in really QML? So say, look at this you know, this is pretty awesome that, like, this is an application that, you know, just shows, you know, the, really the image from the camera, the live image from the camera. So when you run this on an embedded device, then, you know, you will get, a, you know, the full screen live feed from there, which is cool. But, you know, before Qt 5.5, there wasn't really any easy way to you know, do additional processing. Well, of course, you could use shader effects and so on, which is one thing. But, you know, of course, that's a bit limited in some cases. And that's why you have this uh, tiny little addition to Qt Multimedia in Qt 5.5, which we call video filters. Uh, you know, this is basically a modern 
replacement or alternative to the QVDO probe class, which some of you might have heard of. So that's a C++ API of Qt Multimedia, the QVDO probe, which you know, may allow you to do similar things, but it's much more restricted. So there you simply connect to a signal which gets emitted whenever you get a new video frame. But yeah, other than that, it's, uh, there are no further guarantees. So of course the signal may be delivered asynchronously. Then when it comes to you know, platforms where you have GPU resources in your video frame, say on Mac, where you would get, or Android, where you would get an OpenGL texture. You know, processing those is pretty hard with the old approach, since you don't really have access to the OpenGL context, you are on the wrong thread, and so on and so on. So, to summarize, the new video filter approach kind of well, solves all these issues. So, you will, of course, implement the core of your filters, you know, in our case, those will be the calls into OpenCV and some preparation steps, that's in C++. And the rest is, of course, QML, nicely integrating with any video output element. Uh, yes, and like I said, the really cool thing is, which we won't really utilize today, but really it's the GPU story, so that if you happen to use OpenCL or CUDA to do your processing, then this fits very well, since if the platform has, say, an OpenGL texture, then you could just, just use the OpenCL, OpenGL interop, or the equivalents from CUDA to, you know, easily with, with zero copy, you know, uh, set up the equivalent compute resources, do something with them, and then, you know, do something with the results. So the new approach is pretty flexible. The hardware I have here, and which you will see later, is this uh, Freescale Sabre SD board, which has a Vivanti GPU, you know, and of course it's the reference board for the, well, uh, quite popular IMX6 SOC. Yeah, that's it in short. So here I also have a camera, attached straight on the board, and yes, I have a 10-inch touchscreen built in. Now, when it comes to the software stack, I hope that many of you have attended yesterday's embedded talks, because, you know, there was both my talk and then there was a, another talk after that, talking about Qt for device creation. And what we will use here is exactly the reference image, you know, for this Sabre board, which we are shipping. Well, that's a commercial only thing. But we'll use that reference image based on Yocto Dizzy. And, you know, it, it, it also has Qt 5.5. It all runs, you know, on, on EGLFS, so we have like a single full screen Qt application running at a time. And we also have some OpenGL 2.4 lips in libraries included in the image, which is cool, and the corresponding sysroot, of course. Then, uh, IMX6 is basically chosen because that, that, that's kind of a known good environment, a known good board, the IMX6-based boards usually work pretty well with Qt Multimedia, both when it comes to video and camera support. And finally, so of course in case you wonder how OpenCV gets there in your Yocto build, then, you know, it's something like this, so in our extra uh, say boot to cute layer, somewhere we have, this, we have these few lines added, so that we have at least the basic image processing and object detection libraries included in the system image, and of course in the SDK we have the headers and the corresponding libraries. So yeah, like pooling in a third party library like OpenCV is pretty easy with Yocto, given that the necessary recipe recipes are available. Yes, and 
basically this was the slide part. And now we will move on to actually, you know, coding something. So the idea is, uh, yes, let's see it. So what we would like to see running on this device is really, you know, an application which shows the camera image. Maybe there will be some, some control, like some checkbox, just to, just to show that really the combining cute quick controls and the, you know, the video is really possible and it's working quite well. And what we are going to do is that we are going to recognize cute logos. So maybe it's not new to some of you because we have shown similar things in some blog posts on the cute, cute blog some months ago. So now it's really time to see the actual implementation. So, yes, I just need some notes. And okay, let's switch to Linux. Well, I'm running a virtual machine here for the sake of simplicity except that I can't log in. Yes. So, well, I can basically show you the image of the board using this wonderful webcam. I know it's not very nice, but yeah, it's visible. So currently, what we have running here, so the device booted into this so-called cute demo launcher, which is just, you know, a bunch of QML, oops, you know, this is like the same old cinematic experience demo. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Everything is working really well and smoothly. And what really matters is my cute creator. Screen. So, is this visible in the back rows? Yes, no? Oh, okay, let's hope it's sufficient. So, here I have Cute Creator running, and what's more, I also have the board hooked up through a USB cable. And yeah, here I have the extra stuff installed by Cute for Device Creation. So the deployment, like the one-click deployment from the from Creator to the device using USB, that's in place. So let's press Control R and see what happens. Well, it's not quite ready yet, which is mm -hmm. so. Mm. Oh, of course, because it's not actually connected. So we just need to find the cable, disconnect my mouse, since I only have two USB ports. How great is that? And watch now. Hmm. Yes. So the deployment succeeded and well, yeah, this is not worth looking at because it's really a white empty screen, which is pretty blue there, but in fact it's white. Yes, that's it. So with one click, of course, I deployed the application running on the device. I could, of course, debug similarly, just as easily. So now let's just kill this process, the remote process, and let's uh, start doing something. So I have a template here. So this is my project file, so I will use QtQuick, Qt Multimedia, I have a few source files, one QML file, I'm pulling in some OpenCV libraries, and yes, I have some deployment things, since we also have this custom Qt logo XML, which is the, you know, the classifier, which we trained with some, you know, a couple of hundred Qt logo photos, so that it is able to uh, 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 well, hopefully recognize the you know, standard cute logos, say, for example, from this business card. 
Then, uh, well, my main is nothing special. The only interesting thing is that, as you can see, I'm registering here a, a custom type, which is actually, this will be our filter implementation. We'll see this later. So I'm exposing it to QML. And then, yes, this will be the place for the filter code. And yes, we already have this skeleton here. So yes, this is my video filter. It's, we are subclass in QAbstract video filter. And yeah, we'll have to provide an implementation for this factory function. Yeah. And finally, yes, our QML code is pretty simple. There's some simple logic for handling maybe the different like, portrait and landscape on some devices, but other than that, it's all empty. That's why I got a plain empty screen. So, well, so getting the camera there, that's, uh, hmm. well, we already saw that, that won't exactly be any difficult. Well, for the sake of uh, hmm, 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 simplicity, I will request, uh, you know, like a relatively low resolution, and maybe, well, not, yeah, not that it matters as much, but, the, you know, reduce the frame rate to 15 frames per second, just to, you know, keep the, you know, keep things running fast enough. And then, the only thing we need to do is a video output element, which, of course, takes its source from the camera. It feels the parent, well, in our case, that's on the device that will basically be full screen. And okay, this will be important later. Let's just stretch the entire image. So, executing this again. Uh huh, uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yes, something is indeed different now. So, if you look at the device. Yeah, you can see that there's something there. Well, anyway, the point is, it, it indeed shows some image from the camera. Mm, those colors are weird. Anyway. Okay, this was easy and awesome. Now, you know, as I promised, I want to use cute quick controls because, you know, I really think that's one of the primary use cases of this that, you know, mixing your cute UI with multimedia, 3D, or whatever other content. So I'm just going to have a simple checkbox, maybe in a group box, you know, just to make it stand out a bit. And we will start with check through by default, because why not? We want your filter active. Yes, running it again. Well, one click, what happens? Yes. Well, yeah, there is something in the top left corner which I can tap. It even, yeah, I think even the size adapt, adapted pretty well. So, you know, it's, it's pretty much finger usable out of the box, which is, you know, quite good. And now the real fun part. So, what do I need to do here? So we have this interesting split, because as you can see, this is a factory function. And uh, you know, the, the, this pattern here might be familiar to some of you from QQuick item. So if you are implementing custom quick items in C++, then the story is somewhat similar, since you have this split between the QQuick item and the QSG whatever, QSG node. And you know, each quick item will be backed by, you know, one or more sync graph nodes. And it's, it, it's really the sync graph nodes which own all the resources, like the OpenGL resources. And for the same reason, you know, we have a similar split in this API. So we have this so-called QVideo filter runnable. So this, you know, this in a way is, an, is the equivalent of the sync graph nodes. 
So this is the actual, this will be the actual implementation. And the key and the, this filter class, this is the one that lives on the main thread and this gets exposed to QML. So this way you don't really have any, you know, synchronization issues or similar. So we will have a finished signal because we want to maybe, you know, just indicate when or when the processing of a frame is done. And this is, again, pretty cool that when you are using QML, since in QML I can just write on finish, then do something. And this parameter, this Q object, will be just some random Q object with some properties, and that's the result, really, of the filtering. Uh, yeah, okay. For simplicity, let's just add some friend declarations. So, what about the real thing? So we have this filter runnable. Here again, we subclass QVideo filter runnable. We will need a constructor. And the real thing is this run function. Well, it's not hard to guess what this will do. It will take a QVideo frame, then some metadata, which might be important in some cases. So, you know, on some platforms, this QVideo surface format may provide you additional details about you know, like the placement or orientation of the, of the, of, of the image in the QVideo frame. And, mm, yeah, that's pretty much it. And like I said, I will use a cascade classifier from OpenCV to, you know, do the actual work. Yes, so the final thing is the results object. You saw it in the finished signal. So this will be some sort of plain Q object. And uh, yeah, let's say, for example, we will be able to, want to be able to retrieve a list of rectangles from QML. Because of course the result of the object detection will be a list of you know, zero or more rectangles. Yeah, internally that will be a simple Q variant list. No, yeah. Okay, yeah, in fact, we are done with the headers, or the, these classes, now we just need to write some code for the implementation. So, well, the factory function is pretty much, you know, as expected, because in this case, we don't really need to do anything special, well, I can't type. Let's create a new instance. But, the, of course, the interesting part is that this is, this is guaranteed to be called on the render thread. So, you know, on this device we are using the multi-threaded, uh, the threaded renderer of the Qt fixing graph. And this means that the filter runnable, that's actually a Q object which will live on the render thread. Which is good because that's exactly where all the, you know, OpenGL resources live to. Now, implementing that, well, here I don't really have to do much of a setup. So the cool thing here is that, of course, the runnable classes, constructor, destructor, and the run function are, of course, like I said, are guaranteed to be called on the render thread with the cute, with the SYNGRAPHS OpenGL context current. Okay, the latter is not really relevant in this example, but in some other cases that's pr pretty much crucial. So that you know that there, it, it's on the correct thread always and it's, uh, you know, has all the correct contexts. Yes, and or run function. This will be the meat of the thing and we'll get back to this later because I guess just to look at something different. In the meantime, we might want to write some QML code too. So, okay, you saw that I'm implementing something in C++, which is then exposed to QML. And what I'm gonna do here is really that I'm gonna hook it up to the video output. 
So in Qt 5.5, we have introduced this filters property, which is really a list of, well, Q objects. And this filter is in fact nothing more than an instance of this CV filter class, which I exposed. I'm going to create an instance here. And yes, basically this is the you know, connection between you know, video output and the filter. And of course you could have multiple filters, an entire chain if you wanted to. Now we have this wonderful active pro property, which is really cool because we can just you know, bind that to the check Book. Oh, that was escaped. We can just bind it to the, ah, oh, even better. We can just bind it to the checked property of the checkbox. So yeah, this way we can turn the filtering on and off. Well, which was pretty easy. And to make things more exciting, I will declare some custom properties. Because obviously you might want to, you know, provide some parameters to your, you know, computation. And you might want to do that with QML simply because you, know, you might want to you know, set up some bindings or maybe animate them using the usual number animation and so on. So this is a really easy way to you know, provide the parameters to the computation in you know, whatever way you want. So here I will just use two parameters, which are you know, some of them may recognize that these will be the parameters to my detect fun function, we, you know, we will pass this to OpenCV. And, like I said, we have the finished signal. And the handling is nothing more than, you know, adding this unfinished thingy. Yeah. So, a little defensive programming that kind of involves that if the filter is not active anymore, then we return. So, of course, this matters, again, because of the threading, since if I press the checkbox, then, uh, Okay, it could be that the checked property changes, then the active property of the filter changes. But, of course, since the rendering and so the, all the vision stuff happens on the render thread, it could be that we already queue like a, an emission of the finished signal. And then once we get back to the main thread, you know, that gets, of course, emitted there. So it could be that this active property is already false, and yet we still enter unfinished. So, okay, that can just be avoided with a simple check for the active property. And what are my results? So, if you remember the declaration of the signal, it had this Q object E. I don't know why I used E, anyway. That's the result object. And I can just call the rects function, since that's a function invocable also from JavaScript. Okay, so from this point on, we, need, we would need to you know, figure out how do we actually visualize rectangles. So the traditional way, what you will find in pretty much all the you know, OpenCV examples, is that you simply bake in you know, a rectangle in the image, which is awesome, but we can do better. Because, of course, in, in, in QML, Qt Quick, we might want to use actual rectangle elements instead of really drawing, you know, really polluting the original image. So say I will support up to 10, you know, matches. So I have a repeater with this wonderful red rectangles which are, of course, initially all, visible, all invisible. Okay, that was not exactly complicated. And I have a helper function to really make them all invisible because, of course, in some cases, we just want to get rid of all of, all of them. I still can't type. Mm -hmm. Yes, so of course the repeater is, makes it very easy to access the individual items, yes. Yes, and no, of course, you can guess what's coming here. We'll, oh, yes. So now we can do something like unactive changed. You know, we want, so say we, you know, disable the filter, we want to get rid of the rectangles. Well, also if you enable it, of course. Yes. Hmm, okay. So. Now, we, 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 what we would need to do is simply go through the results and position the rectangles accordingly. 
Well, that's not exactly difficult. Of course, if there are no matches, then we simply do nothing, and yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, this is a bit uh, not that exciting, since we need to really calculate where the no rectangle should go, and of course for that, you know, we need to take, take into account some aspect ratio stuff, and then we will just position things relatively to the video output, video output the top left corner. Okay. Yes, so this is a really a object with x, x, y with height properties. And yes, no, this is the place where we really start positioning them. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, the width, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, of course, in singular. And then the height. Well, yeah. And finally, we make it visible. Oops. So at this point, if unless I mistype something, you know, we can really visualize where our results are. Well, that was awesome. And the only thing is but, but what's really missing is well the actual implementation. So okay, from this point on I'm a bit tired of typing. So yeah, I will just take some snippets. Nonetheless, we will go through it. So, okay, so we, will go, we are going to simplify things since, as you can see here, well, we know that on this particular device, on this platform, I will get a, cert, a certain YUV format in my video frames. So, yeah, for now, we'll only support that one. Then comes the usual you know, let's try to map it. Well, okay, that's only to be nice because frankly that's a no-op on this particular platform because, I mean, anyway, I already have a proper CPU side pointer. It, but anyway, if this fails, because who knows, maybe on some platforms this is actually needed, if this fails, we just bail out. Okay, and at this point on, we can of course, you know, access really the pixels or the data, the bytes directly in the video frame. And now, previously, so I said that the, really the image conversion thing is not exactly rocket science, and well, you know, it's pretty simple. So what we are doing here is that we will set up, a, you know, an OpenCV image, which, you know, it's YUV, so you just need to calculate the width and height correctly. And then, uh, hmm. ah, yeah. Oh, right, so the thing, yes, it was a bit invisible. So, of course, this is the real interesting part that, of course, we input bits. So, we will create an OpenCV image which, you know, takes the data from the video frame. And then, since we want to, we don't want to work with YUV data, we just do a conversion. Well, yeah, simple. And then, yeah, we have an OpenCV image, which is in, you know, 8UC3 format, so 3-channel, 8-bit per channel format. So, yeah, that presents no surprises. Okay, then we unmap, and then, well, the rest is pretty simple. So I will need to convert to grayscale since, you know, I just know that the operations I'm going to do here pretty work, work, work best on, on a grayscale image. Then, well, for, we will just flip it since the camera configuration is a bit bizarre since everything is upside down there. And then we will create a results object which, you know, we will, you know, pass back to QML, and we will also transfer the ownership, so no parenting, no nothing. The, this will be then managed by the, you know, JavaScript side. 
So we don't keep ownership on the C++ side. And then all we, all we have to do is, well, we basically create our classifier. So this is uh, this Qt logo XML I mentioned earlier. So yeah, to be safe, I will really pick up the, you know, the, the directory where the, where the application, the executable is, since the concept of the current directory is a bit uh, shaky in our current setup, so when I execute something remotely, remotely, then, you know, I'm not entirely sure what the current directory is, so that's why I'm basically using absolute passes. Okay, let's get some decent C string from it, and then, yes, the OpenCV thing. Well, yeah, that's it. So now we have this classifier, created. Well, of course, we only do this once. Yes, and yeah, given that the XML file is there, then hopefully everything will be fine. Then, now, nah, let's just copy. And then this is the meat of the thing. So, okay, I will have a vector of rects. This is cool. And then this here is what I mentioned earlier, that since we know that all the threading is done properly, I can here be sure that in the run function I can safely access the properties of the filter. But you know, that, like this M filter object lives on the main thread and we are here on the render thread. But yet, you know, this is guaranteed to be safe here. So this is the synchronized step Again, there, this is similar to the synchronized step for QQuick items. So yeah, this is the exact same concept. So we simply fetch the actual values. And finally, yes, this is the actual object detection. We call this detect multiscale function of the classifier passing or parameters or, or image. Yeah. Or there. And finally, we create cute, friendly rectangles. You know, we simply fill up our uh, Q variant list with Q rects. Yes, it's simply x, y with height. And uh, yeah, basically the work is done. What happens now? Emit, M filter finished. Yes, and at this point on, the rest is, you know, done on, 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 on the QML side. Uh, now, of course, you probably realize that this also allows asynchronous operations. So, you now if you really want to just start, you know, the computation and you don't want to wait for it to finish because maybe it's so slow and you simply just can't afford to block the video pipeline, then of course you could start computations on multiple frames and uh, you know simply emit you know your finished signal when when the computations are, are really finished. So yeah, it's pretty flexible. You can pretty much do whatever you need. No problem there. And finally, well, we need to return a video frame. So the simplest option would be to do this, because here we don't modify anything, so it just return the input. But for the sake of the example, we will, well, basically use the grayscale and flipped version of the image, just to see that converting things from Qt, no, from OpenCV to Qt is pretty simple too. So from grayscale, we are going to BGRA, and then we simply create a Q image, you know, taking the data from the OpenCV image, which, and now I will need a Q video frame, which is, yeah, we, I will just take the Q image, except that, well, we need to swap the red and blue. So, in theory, this is now all done. Yeah, there were some warnings, but, whoa. So it compiled, which means that I can type pretty damn well. 
Oh, yeah, well, what can I say? Let's just try to run it. Yes, so on the QML side, I definitely made some mistakes since on... Yes, it's changed, not changes. Well, no. Second try. Okay. Yes, I have an image. Uh, I'll show you it in a minute. Ha ha. It's awesome. I made a single letter mistake. And the rest. So, as you can see, there's the image. Well, it's actually grayscale and flipped. So even our backwards conversion is working. Yes, so if I turn up the filtering, you saw that, you know, it's, it's the original image. It's color and not non-flipped. Whereas if I activate the filtering, it's, it's our modified image. And now, here's this business card. And yes, you see that rectangle around the thing. It's there. So the, even the OpenCV course gives some results. And the list containing one rectangle gets returned. And then we just position the rectangle item on the QML side. Let's see if it works with the smaller one. Whoops. Uh huh. Indeed. It picks that up too. Well, yeah. Well, that's it in short. As you can see, the, the, the whole thing is working pretty well. So, the, you know. One click deployment through USB straight to a device, cute, cute, big, cute multimedia, external frameworks working together nicely. You know, I don't know, I think this is pretty powerful. So, yes, thank you very much. I guess we have quite some time for questions if there are any. So, you know, feel free to ask. I guess we might use that microphone if necessary. Hello. Hello. Um, I know that OpenCV also supports something like QDEV wrappers for hardware accelerated. Uh, can you repeat that? OpenCV also supports something like CUDA or OpenCL uh, hardware accelerated operations. Is it possible to also wrap this into Qt for embedded? Well, it depends. Maybe. So, so okay. Of course, in in case of this device, it's out of question since we don't have really working op OpenCL here. But you know, on other platforms, say on desktop, well, in theory, it's possible. But the question is that how much uh, control or that, that does OpenCV really expose the possibility to you know pass in like an OpenCL or CUDA, you know, image. Because, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but it, if, if it really hides everything away, so of course, then it may not work that well, since, of course, what you would really want to do here is that, okay, if you have an OpenGL texture, then, you know, use the CLGL interop, and then somehow pass that, that resulting OpenCL handle into OpenCV. And, of course, I'm not entirely sure if that's possible or not. But... Yeah, other than that, of course, in, 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 in theory, it's a possibility is there. But there might be some minor issues along the way. But, you know, really, just try it. <laughs> Hi. Have you experienced um, any performance issues um, concerning the frame rate when using a camera with the multimedia? Um, QML module, because I've worked with, an, I think, an older version, I think it was under Qt 5.2, and I could only get frame weight rates up to 15 frames per second. Yeah, that's uh, inter interesting. So, no, in generally, no. So, of course, I would expect that you get whatever is the maximum supported frame rate by the camera. So, of course, the things I tried, like here, it works pretty well. So here we, of 
course, we even had to, as you saw, explicitly turn it down to 15 because it does more by default. So I'm not really aware of any such problems. But then again, it, it, it depends on the what platform or environment you are in. So, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Any more questions? No? Okay, that's good. Sure. So, thank you very much.